Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Athena, for inviting me to be part of this series of seminars. And today, um, well, first of all, I'm Diana Pazmiño. I am a faculty for Universidad San Francisco de Quito. And today I will be uh, talking about hybridization in sharks, a specific case of the Galapagos and the dusky shark in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And I want to start telling you a little bit about hybridization in sharks. This is a topic we don't know much about. Um, we have only a handful of known cases of hybridization in sharks. Today I will tell you the case of the Galapagos and Dusky shark. Um, and this was part of a bigger project that aimed at developing and screening um, a, a genome-wide SNP data set in order to um, improve and inform conservation for the Galapagos shark. Why the Galapagos shark? Well, this is one of the over 30 species that occur in the Galapagos and one that is considered a priority for conservation. Despite this, and before this uh, big project started, we knew very little about this species in most of its um, distribution. And all the information we had was coming from very specific locations. And so we thought it was um, a, a very important thing to develop more information. And one of our aims was to develop this panel of diagnostic SNPs that were capable to tell us what was happening between these and other closely related species, the dusky shark. Um, when you see these two species underwater, it's nearly impossible to tell them apart. The only morphological difference is that the Galapagos shark has more uh, vertebrae, 15 to 20 more vertebrae than the dusky shark. And the other ecological difference is that while the dusky shark prefers coastal areas, as we can see in the map in blue, uh, the Galapagos char has a preference for isolated oceanic islands. And there are three places in the world where they are known to um, co-occur. In 2012, um, um, a study that um, tried to assess relationships uh, um, across um, a big number of shark species included four sequences of Galapagos sharks from um, Hawaii. And all four uh, individuals clustered within the dusky shark lake. So it was suggested at that time that the Galapagos shark might not be a separate species, but rather an oceanic phenotype of the dusky shark. Um, in 2017, um, a, a, another study um, finally was able to delimitate these as two separate species using SNPs. So the mitochondria was not capable to tell them apart, and the, um, the biggest difference was seen between ocean basins rather than between species when using mitochondrial DNA. Um, and they also suggested um, a historical introgression between the two species. We um, found something similar using the mitochondrial control region. Uh, this marker, again, does a good job into separating other species from the genus, but not these two. Um, so we developed um, a panel of SNPs using DART-seq, and after a thorough and very um, um, intensive process of filtering, we went from nearly 60,000 SNPs to a bit less than 2,000 SNPs. And um, for the analysis, I will um, tell you now the series of steps that we went um, through to confirm these cases of hybridization. So with the SNPs, we did an initial net view and structure evaluation of the discreteness uh, and level of admixture between around 200 individuals from each species. We found um, two well-defined clusters. Uh, again, I'm showing in blue the dusky shark and in red the Galapagos shark. Um, each cluster corresponding to each species. But interestingly, we found these four individuals here that did not cluster either with one or the other um, species. So from now on, we started calling these the putative um, hybrids. Then we did... Um, a clustering analysis in structure, removing these putative hybrids um, in order to define the purest individuals from each of the species. And we choose the 50 purest Galapagensis and the 50 purest um, Dusky by choosing those with a higher probability of assignment to either one cluster or the other. Then once we had the pure parental individuals, we use the PIGAS R package to calculate FSTs and selected two discriminant data sets, one with SNPs uh, that had higher FSDs than 95% and one with SNPs that, higher FSD, that had high FSDs higher than 90%. 
So the one with um, uh, the threshold of 95% had 69 SNPs, and the one with the threshold of 90% had 117 SNPs. And we ran another um, network um, analysis, including the putative hybrids and the 50 purest individuals. And again, as we can see here, we have these four putative individuals sort of connecting these clusters. Our next step was to test the power of the discriminatory SNP selected to assign or classify individuals. And for this, we use a simulation approach using the hybrid lab software, which um, basically takes the pure parentals and simulate different hybrid classes from here. We um, produce 50 individuals from 10 hybrid classes, F1s, F2s, and further back cross generations. Uh, and what I wanted to show in this graph is that um, even though both datasets were capable to um, simulate all 10 hybrid classes, uh, there's more error in the, um, in the smaller uh, dataset, in the one with only 69 SNPs. And we consider this very important because we cannot rely only on the power of um, the discrimination power given by FSTs, but we need to balance this with an appropriate number of markers as well. And from now on, I will show you only the results for this um, set of 117 SNPs. Um, with the simulated hybrid classes, we run structure once more as a reference to test the accuracy of the simulated hybrids. And in the graph on top, we have all 10 classes uh, from pure uh, Galapagensis in red to pure Obscurus in blue. And uh, what, one thing that we can see here is, for example, that the F1 um, hybrid class uh, show almost a perfect half and half proportion. So um, the, the, um, um, the, the simulations were pretty good in general. And then we run the same test for our empirical data. So our 50 purest Galapagensis, or 50 purest Obscurus, and then our four putative hybrids. And what we can see here is that the putative hybrids show different percentages of admixture between um, the two species. So our final step was running a reassignment test using the software new hybrids, which uses a Bayesian approach to determine the posterior probability that each sample individual belongs specifically to one of the 10 categories that we previously simulated. And here are our results for both um, the simulated and the empirical data. And what we can see is that with higher confidence, these different four putative hybrids are assigned to different classes. We have two F1s, we have one uh, first generation backcross, and we have one uh, third generation backcross. Uh, but what does that mean? What are the implications? For that, I'm going to put place the hybrids um, in the map in the Eastern Tropical Pacific. So our first hybrid is the first generation backcross, uh, which was found in the Southern Galapagos. What happens in Galapagos? Um, we have Galapagos sharks here, but we don't have reports of the dusky shark. And it's very unlikely that the dusky sharks occur here due to the or ex exten extensive sampling first, but also due to the continuous monitoring that the authorities and the other projects have here. But there are um, reports of dusky shark along this coast and also farther north. Um, then we have the other two hybrids, both in, uh, from Cabo Pulmo in the Gulf of California. One is an F1, and the other one is the third generation backcross towards Obscurus. Um, this is one of the three places in the world where we know the, trees, the two species of cure, sorry. Um, so we have a lot of Obscurus, but also um, some Galapagensis um, occurring there. And we have the fourth hybrid, um, an F1, that was sampled in the Clipperton Atoll, which is nearly a thousand kilometers from the coast of Mexico. And Galapagos are uh, nearly a thousand kilometers from the mainland Ecuador as well. So what do we think is happening? We think the more likely thing um, is that uh, the hybrids are, um, the, the, the hybridization, sorry, is occurring uh, close to the Gulf of California in the north and the hybrids are the ones moving um, southwards towards the Galapagos and eventually coming here and reproducing with other Galapagos. So um, another possibility is that hybridization is occurring here in the Clipperton Atoll or very close to here. Why we suggest that it's that and not um, the hybrids moving? Because these two individuals are juveniles. So the probability of these two juveniles migrating such long distances are very, very low. And the implications for conservations 
are also important because as I said, one of these species is um, bigger than the other one. So what it, it's very likely that the lending data we have from these um, species is not um, correct. That we have been, it's so easy to, um, uh, to misidentify them that we probably don't know uh, or don't have an accurate estimate of, um, of the um, risk for each of the two species. And with this, I want to thank you all and to thank to um, everybody that has been part of this project. We still have a lot to do. Um, we still need to do something in some of the intermediate areas and especially uh, along the coast of Southern Central America. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to um, do this uh, very, very soon. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Diana. So, Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Serena Acha. Serena is a postdoc at the University of Florida Herbarium and the Missouri Botanical Garden. And she's going to talk about 2B rat and passion flower systematics. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the invitation. Let me, do you see my screen? Yep. Okay, great. So let me put that on the presentation more. Okay, thank you everyone. Hope that uh, everyone is safe. Um, I'm right now a postdoc at the, the University of Florida Herbarium, but I'm going to be talking today about my PhD work in passion flowers and how I use RATSIG for this. Let me set up and present. Okay, cool. Okay, so as a general introduction, Passiflora is the genus where passion flowers uh, are. We also know them like passion fruits. This group has 600 species, so it's a kind of a good sized uh, genus. We know it for its beautiful flowers and the tasty fruits, and of course the interaction with pollinators and herbivores like the Heliconia butterflies. But in this study, what we did is focusing in a smaller group inside uh, Passiflora, the section, the Caloba, that's how we call it, that includes 120 species. And to the right, a graph of a phylogeny produced by Krosnik, where they included all the rest of other clades in, this, in the Passiflora genus. But we will be talking about this section, uh, the Caloba, that included uh, 120 species and is uh, smaller and is the least known uh, or well studied group in all passion flowers. And with this, I'm going to show you a little bit of the diversity in the morphology that we found in this group. All these are pictures of different species in section the uh, Caloba, and hopefully, you'll see the variation in morphology and colors of the flowers. Not only that, we also have a uh, wide variation in leaf morphology. And all this makes sometimes the systematics study for these plants to be quite challenging. And with all that, um, I propose it to reconstruct the phylogeny of this section and to solve um, the evolutionary history within and among species, so two different scales, and the biogeography of section the Caloba. And I'm going to mention briefly methods. So we mainly focus on herbarium specimens. So we extracted quite uh, many samples, more than 700 samples. And of course, in this case, we use 2B rat seek. So that's a flavor of rat seek that uh, produces shorter fragments, 36 base pairs fragments. Uh, and is usually used for uh, population genomics studies. Uh, we did the assembly as Nip calling using the IPARAD toolkit, and we used traditional known phylogenic reconstruction methods in Raximil and BEAST. And finally, we did an ancestral area reconstruction using RAS and BioGeoverse. For the last component of the biogeography analysis, we had to define uh, a priori areas that are shown in the map in different colors, and all those black dots that you see in the map are all the accessions that we included in the final analysis in our study. And with that, I want to mention a side uh, result that I found interesting, especially when you're working with herbarium specimens. So we did several, a, a lot of extraction, like 900 extractions in green dots on the graph to the right. 
uh, sometimes um, extracting more than once or, or three times the same sample. Of all these extraction, only 400 uh, had the minimum concentration to be uh, work further in the to be RATSIC protocol. But with all these, only 219 accessions were successfully sequenced at the end. But as hopefully you can see, there's no correlation between concentration or the age of the specimen. And that's quite important because herbarium uh, specimens were used and um, that means that mm, doesn't matter the age of collection of the, of the sample, it means the quality or other conditions of collections. And with all that, I want to mention that of those 219 accessions, we were able to get 110 taxa represented. So the majority of species in section the Caloba were represented in phylogeny, and we included several accession per taxon. And here the details of the to be read assembly, the number of base pairs, loci, and of course the missing information was important. It was quite high, but it seemed that it didn't affect that much the analysis. And I'm going to show like a brief uh, view of the analysis. First, the phylogenetic analysis uh, discovered with RAXML. Here is the main tree that we found. And of course, we included all four taxa as an outgroup, and we main, and we found the main clades being the first one, Central America, with 29 taxa, and South American clade with 78. So that was, that was quite interesting. Not only that, we also in uh, including the biogeographical analysis. I'm not going to go into details, but we found similar pattern with Central American clay, South American clay. And in this case, we were able to infer some, um, some dates like the section, the Caloba uh, origin date for 10.4 million years ago. And the most likely origin of section, the Caloba estimated to be from Central America. Beside that, we also went into deep, into deep detail in the phylogeny, and I'm going to mention some interesting findings uh, that were possible. Like, for example, Passifloral nifolia, a widespread Andean species that um, it has created a lot of uh, problems because it is highly variable in the morphology of the flower and the leaf, and is widespread to uh, Colombia and Ecuador. So that created a lot of concern with taxonomies. And when we went deep into the South American clade and tried to find that section that we, found, that we included in the green box, we realized that it wasn't monophyletic and it's probably um, a species complex or something else happening there. So we needed to go deeper into that. And that's why we decided to include more accessions for Passifloral nifolia and the related, related species and that's what we produce here. So here would be a phylogenetic reconstruction in this case produced by tetra and to the right a structure plot with each color being a genetic cluster. In this case if we go to the details and trying to find the alnifolia species are in red and the name here is marked in red we'll see that they are all around the place again not being monophyletic. And if we include another species that was confused with it, Passiflora chelidonia, the same happens again. They are mixed and we cannot find a clear pattern. And if we include uh, other two species that were usually confused and they also occur in Colombia and Ecuador in the mountain, um, the mountain forest, the same happens again. So with all this, we can uh, infer that the evolutionary relationships and patterns of genetic structure do not match the Alnifolia group at um, taxonomic changes need to happen. And with all that, the overall conclusions from this work was that this study resulted in a well-supported phylogeny for a highly diverse, widely distributed, and rapid radiated group. The use of herbarium specimens allowed them sample and it was successful. So I think that's a very good message for general in the herbarium collections and uh, people that cannot go to do field work to widespread to collect widespread groups. Also, the to be rat seek uh, technique is sufficient variable to resolve relationship in radiations like this. And we propose, of course, the first hypothesis of the biogeography for this section, the Caloba. 
and we have built foundation for a comprehensive taxonomy in passion flowers, uh, solving problems that weren't, solve, uh, weren't capable to be solved until now. And with all that, I want to thank my committee members um, that help in all that. And of course, this is a product uh, of a lot of collaboration with herbarium uh, uh, specialists and, of course, um, geneticists. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I'll take any questions.